um, just so, so that you are all aware that this event is really part of an ongoing five-year um, commemoration celebration of the change in the name of our um, institution. Um, previously, it was known as um, Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University, but um, in 2017, uh, that name changed to Nelson Mandela University. And as we fondly like to call it, Mandela University. And having mentioned Mandela, I would like to just um, reiterate a quote that he had said, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. And therefore this year in um, April, on the, on the 6th of April, we launched a structure, the Palestinian support organization at Mandela University to actively participate in um, advocacy against the oppression of um, the Palestinian people. So if anybody is interested in joining um, as an active member of our PSO, you are most welcome to complete the form. Um, the link of that will be posted in, our, uh, in the chat. So the program for um, today, welcome obviously, and I will be introducing um, the um, guest speaker shortly. Um, Leslie um, was the chair of um, Youth Unemployment and Empowerment. She will provide a short overview with regards to the um, two books that will be discussed, after which um, the authors will present the, the um, respective books. And then Samira will facilitate any um, questions that may um, be posed by um, the audience. And you may use um, the chat function to post any of your um, of your questions, after which Samira will sum up with a closing and thanks. So in terms of our authors, it is quite an unusual um, uh, occasion where both of our authors are female authors from Palestine. So the first author, Dr. Hadil Abu Hussein, is a research fellow at the Hague-based um, International Institute of uh, Social Studies, Erasmus University, Rotterdam. She holds a PhD in law from the National University of Ireland in Galway, an LLB and LLM degrees at Tel Aviv University. And she's also a member of the Israel um, Lawyers Bar. Her research has explored the evolution of land law within ethnic states and how states are constructing land regime to exercise the exclusion of minority groups engaging with international law and the insights of legal geography theory. Previously, she was also a fellow at the um, Middle East Center, St. Anthony's College, um, University of Oxford, as well as a, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Zurich and a senior research fellow and consultancy advisor at the Max Planck um, Foundation for International Peace and the Rule of Law in Heidelberg, um, Germany. So that is our um, Hadil Abu Hussein. I will now um, introduce Dr. Randa Hilal. So she is a, a researcher and consultant and has worked in the education, development and TVET sectors at sectoral, institutional and programmatic levels. She has worked with various um, international organizations and have published widely, um, having uh, numerous uh, uh, papers, reports and um, journal publications behind the name. She is also director of Optimum and Optimum is an organization that is, um, participates in consultancy and training. And she has um, a PhD from the University of Nottingham. So it is my pleasure now to hand over to um, Dr. Leslie Powell, who's an active member, by the way, of um, the PSO and also a member of um, BDS. Um, she is the chair of youth 
and, uh, or chair youth unemployment and empowerment and will be taking us through um, an overview of the two books. Leslie, over to you. Thanks, thanks so much, um, Ruby Ann, for that warm welcome. So Ruby Ann didn't actually introduce herself. So Ruby Ann Levendahl is the Director of Transformation and also an active member of our PSO at Nelson Mandela University. I'm really happy to be able to talk very briefly about the two books that are being launched today. And I'm happy mainly because these are two Palestinian women. They are friends, they are comrades, they are colleagues and they are sisters. And while there are many, many strong Palestinian scholars, so many of the presentations that I've gone to over the last 12 months have been with male academics. So it's really wonderful to have both of you here, Hadil and Randa. And our hope is that at some point we can have you physically on our soil. Um, I'd like to support uh, the welcome that Ruby Ann did earlier. But I'd also like to welcome Prof. Simon McGrath from the University of Glasgow, who supervised the PhD on which Randa's book is based. So welcome, Simon. Um, I saw that Falker had RSVP'd. He hasn't joined us yet. But Falker is the head of the school at the University of Nottingham, where Randa's study was undertaken. So just big welcome to Simon and later Falker if he joins. I know how busy you are, so thank you so much for making the time and for the solidarity. It's quite difficult to talk about these books without doing a spoiler. So I'm just going to talk in very general terms and quite quickly. The heart of these books and what they both share, and of course, being Palestinians, is the extreme inequality, marginalization, and oppression of the Palestinian people. Hadil tackles this through a detailed and comprehensive and almost relentless examination of the land law for Palestinians under Israeli law. And she draws on the literature of decolonization and located within a legal framework, she takes enormous, meticulous care to map out in the painful history of land law in Israel and the implications for our present time, including the recent Sheikh Jarrah um, crisis. And she talks about it in such a detailed way. And whilst the focus of her book is on uh, the colonization of Palestinian land and drawing, of course, from a legal framework and the structural legal context, she speaks about the way in which Palestinian people have responded to this oppression and also the way in which the international community has responded. So it's not just a book about the legal structure, but it's also a book about the gentle response of the Palestinian people and of the international community. And she maps this out in such meticulous detail. I really would suggest you get hold of the book because you can't possibly in the 20 minutes or 30 minutes that it's been allocated to her, capture the depth of the detail that she that she engages in. I think it's a 280 page, or I can't quite, it's quite a long, I mean, it's over 200 page book. So she talks about the Israeli land laws, including the Annexation Act in 1967 and to the present and, and maps out each of these laws and the way in which it contradicts with international law, contradicts with human rights principles, with human rights laws, and the way in which we've challenged it. Contrary to much media arguments, I've been looking at a lot of media recently, I've been talking about the quality of Palestinians who live within what the Israeli state calls Jerusalem, a book together with the previous journal papers maps out in detail the discrimination, the apartheid, or what she also calls the architecture of exclusion that Palestinian people living in what the Israeli state called now called Jerusalem experience. Again, it's the detail and the careful nature of this work and the way in which she relentlessly and steadily and with absolute energy maps out the apartheid nature of the Israeli state. This book needs much deeper engagement than the time that we've given to Hadil today. And I'm really hoping that people will get a copy and engage with this work because it really needs that kind of careful, careful reading. 
Randa comes at this question of oppression and marginalization and inequality, particularly from a very different direction. Her important piece of work offers a penetrating analysis of vocational education and training in Palestine, located firmly within the struggle for an in the independence of Palestine. Randa provides an excellent situational analysis of VT provision or vocational education and training that talks to the ways in which the military occupation and human rights violations limit Palestinian access to education in general, including vocational education and training. She recognizes that all Palestinians living under the military occupation and its related policies and regime are marginalized. She applies a capability approach and an intersectional, intersectional and political economy lens to empirically show that intersectional inequalities exist that increases the, the way in which that oppression is experienced by some groups of Palestine, Palestinians as compared to others. She applies a mixed methodology and qualitative interviews as well as quantitative methods. And she unpacks once again in relentless detail and from the voices of Palestinians, the ways in which these intersectional inequalities are experienced. One such is with women who shared that they suffered both from the oppression of the Israeli occupation, but that they also suffer from the patriarchal structures within which they live, which affect the access to education and training in, in important ways. So in both cases, you know, it's really impossible for these authors to do justice to their work in the time that's been allocated. And I would strongly hope that those of us who are present will get a copy of the book and will engage the depth of the work and the incredible detail that both of these authors just have the incredible detail they've went in, gone into to map the context of VT for Randa and for Hilal, the land, the, the context and the, not the debate, but the depth of the oppression of the Palestinian people and the way in which Israeli land laws have systematically over the last since the 1960s been able to basically take over colonize parts of what should be Palestinian land so I want to hand over to the authors now because I'm taking a little bit more time that I would like and I don't actually like speaking on behalf of these amazing scholars um, I think let me hand to the facilitator who is Samira Patel. Samira is active, is an active and very valuable member of our PSO at Nelson Mandela University, and she works within governance at the university. Samira, can I hand over to you? Thank you, thank you, Leslie. Uh, uh, as Leslie said, I'm Samira. I'm actually standing in for Comrade Giovanni, who is not feeling well tonight. So I really hope I do justice tonight. But anyway, um, Leslie had me at an architecture of exclusion and at inequalities and at the thread of apartheid that runs through both of the books. So we are deeply, uh, we, we, always, we already resonating with what is about to come. So I'd like to, um, without further ado, it must be my pleasure to hand over to uh, Dr. Um, Had Hadila Abu Hussain. Thank you. Thank you, Samira. Thanks very much for uh, the Palestinian Solidarity Organization at Nelson Mandela University today for having uh, and the, uh, at the center also for the advancement of uh, non-racism and democracy for hosting this event today. Many thanks to Ruby, Ann, Leslie and Samira for facilitating this event today. And I'm so delighted to be joined by Randa for this evening for having more uh, Palestinian voices uh, within the academia. And I'm so delighted to be with you all today, uh, even virtually. So I'm trying, I will try to uh, summarize my uh, book and the main ideas I try to input within the book within the 20 minutes. It's uh, um, uh, almost impossible task, but uh, thanks for um, Leslie putting kind of this uh, introduction beautifully and briefly. 
So my book title is The Struggle for Land Under Israeli Law. Um, my more literature, I, my preferred uh, uh, title is uh, The Architecture of Exclusion. So my book in nutshell explores and analyzes land law through the lenses of international law, colonization, and legal geography in general. Uh, sorry, I need to put just my timer to know where I should stop. And in particular, it aims to provide a comprehensive and scholarly examination of land and legitimacy for Palestinian under Israeli law. It focuses in land law, provided an overview of the right of land under international law, as in the first chapter, followed by the background for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Subsequently, it explores the underpinning of the land regime in Israel, while also focusing in land expropriation and in particular in forced housing eviction. In particular, my uh, case examination will be was in uh, East Jerusalem, Sheikh Jarrah case. Land, as we all know, is one of the main core resources of the human existence, development and activity. Therefore, it's a key of basis of political power and social and economic status. Land regimes and the planning regulations play a dynamic role in deciding how competing claims over resources will be resolved. According to the legal geography theory, law and space are significant aspects of one another, and they examine, among other things, how spatial ordering impact legal regimes, how legal rules from social and how human space distribution. How has law shaped the development of social and political space? Examining the state of Israel in, in the, the case of my book provide an example of filling the gaps and silence in domination historical narratives and understanding the historical background of the creation of the legal system toward empowering the ideology, strong nationalism, domination of one ethnic group. In the case of Israel is Jewish versus non-Jewish Palestinian people within the Green Line. This, and East Jerusalem as well, this led to superior position of Jewish space onto the state space and exclusion the Palestinian within any accessibility to land. This was accompanied by attempts to minimize those associated with the Palestinian presence in the landscape. Against this backdrop, my book tried to end over to understand the spatial strategies adopted by Israeli to organize the entire territorial expansion of the country as only Jewish, while also excluding Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel and residents of East Jerusalem from the landscape generally. The systematic nature and the process of the marginalization are mapped out in various ways across the civil, political, socio and economic landscape, not only merely accessibility to land questions. When I start thinking about the book, my aim and scope was to provide comprehensive scholarly examination of the law and practices regarding access to land in Israel. Despite excellent work in the field, there is urgent needs to explain the transformative, the transformative nature of the law and land policies related to the unique case of East Jerusalem. My book traces the evaluation of land in past and up to contemporary times through lenses of international law. It then seeks to explore, analyze development linked to accessibility to land and the identity, the context of exclusion are Palestinian. It's specifically examining land expropriation, forced housing eviction in East Jerusalem. Also, also, it's fruitfully analyzing the case study in depth in such practices, meeting with the people and a semi-structure interview. The struggle they are going through the Israeli court legal system still by trying to protect their rights to, for their homes. The book considers international laws, specifically international humanitarian and the human rights laws, wherever relevant. I'm using also national law, also a particularly and the practices in planning laws from, and examples from national courts regarding, like Israeli national courts regarding the forced eviction cases. The book comprised six main chapters. Following the introduction, my chapter two provides the view of land rights in the context of international law, nothing related to Palestine. Generally, broader introduction of what land law means in international law. And then it examined the focus specifically on violation related to land expropriation and forced eviction internationally. Chapter three then moves to 
historical backdrop to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, especially focusing on the narratives and the constructions of architectural movement for Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel and residents of East Jerusalem. An examination of history leading up to the current Israeli-Palestinian conflict provides a necessity context to the current status of Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel. It then turns to land and property rights as a way to lead up to detailed examination of the Israeli land regime. In the following chapter, chapter four, it examines how the law and the legal mechanism were used to establish the current land regime in Israel. The infrastructure that led to establishment of the current Israeli laws was partly adopted from the Britain previous colonial role and the Ottomans, also the previous uh, colonial role. Israel used the law to exercise control over land, thereby shifted the balance of power towards the new Israeli population, Jewish new ethnicity, the dominant ethnicity in new established Israel. Chapter five presents the detailed case study of Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood in East Jerusalem, where illegal struggle over housing rights has been ongoing for nearly five decades. It provides legal case, review of the legal case in Israeli courts reaching the Supreme Court of Israel. And it's supported by interviews with the people who've been victim or lived under the threat of daily threat of forced eviction from their homes. As well, the interviews with attorneys involved in the legal cases, geography experts and NGOs representatives. In addition, a rich account, it provides the legal struggle of residents facing a threat of eviction and their personal experience. This chapter demonstrates particularly how law has become a useful tool of authorities to maintain power and spatial control. The final section of this chapter evaluates the usefulness of the current legal system and the dilemma that the people living under the threat Questioning as itself if it's useful to use the Israeli legal system. Still, this is the only legal system they are eligible to try to use in order to save their homes, rather than the international uh, legal system, sadly. Which links to the nature of Israeli land regimes, to the implication of implored, uh, imposed in exclusion of Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel and residents of Israel. The methodology I used drawn from existing literature from various disciplines, primary international law, but also it's included history, political science, post-colonial studies, and legal geography fields. In terms of re relevant resources, the methodology involves archival research, like deep archival research and reviewing, critiquing primary materials such as international and domestic case law and international human rights law particularly from national legislation and other domestic legal system. Material from international organization, including documents from national legislation, commentators, reports, also been used in my um, fieldwork research and archival research. Finally, in order to inform and enrich my legal analysis, in this book, I include semi-structure interviews conducted as mentioned already during my field work in East Jerusalem and Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood in particular. Then this, the idea was behind this to inform and enrich the drawing on contemporary case law example that going on th through the present day. To try to summarize this briefly and more probably clearly, the book tried to examine the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a contemporary example, present and present day. Subsequently, it explored the foundation of land regime in Israel. It examines the construction of Israeli land regime, so as understands the development of exclusion of non-Jewish uh, people uh, access to the land to maintain the majority control over land within the hand of Jewish, as the like. Uh, ethnicity, one ethnicity. The contemporary case of East Jerusalem is unique, important case with the remarkable feature of the emphasis in the transformative nature of law when it applies to the case of forced housing eviction. Despite excellent work in the field, what I'm trying as can be found in the existing literature while dealing with violations to land rights of Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel, there are common characteristics in the historical background of the book 
that are an existing books that I'm trying not unexpected giving this book. This book, my book, my attempt was in this book to try to address the interesting contemporary issues such as Israeli-Palestinian conflict, in addition to have to highlight the shed light in the uniqueness of the um, East Jerusalem uh, people. And uh, these subjects include land rights, minority rights, human rights, violation, and more. Nevertheless, the book focuses in situation of East Jerusalem and Palestinian residents of East Jerusalem, their unique status and unique of, uniqueness of East Jerusalem, in particular, how the international law community uh, perspective, different than the perspective of Jew, uh, Israel, includes different views on one hand as well, on the official Israeli view interfere with domestic law in the cases linked to the forced eviction in East Jerusalem territory, on the other hand. Hence, the book pre pre uh, presents contemporary examination of land rights for Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel and residents of East Jerusalem, as well examine forced house eviction through the detailed study of Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood in East Jerusalem. This contemporary example and the difficulties while dealing with this illegal apps aspects of the case study. The book covers ongoing struggle for Palestinian residents of East Jerusalem and the consequences of their daily life, not just theoretically uh, academic purely work and close examination of their current situation, following up new updates of this, what's also this book try to kind of interest the reader and try to cover and contain. In addition, it was essential for me to examine the international land law in order to highlight land rights and international law, as well as the to determine how this can be helpful tool to reflect on this case study as described. Later, this book would also example, uh, examine a different standpoint among domestic and international law while dealing with East Jerusalem land rights. And it makes Jerusalem as the core issue when dealing with Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Hence, the background of international law is presented at the beginning was essential to draw important answer and comparison in the concluding chapter. Against this backdrop remains as an urgent need to explore transformative nature of uh, the law as, as already mentioned, land policies, planning law linked to Jerusalem in particular, Examining the states of Israel provides an example of filling the gaps in silence in dominant historical narratives and understanding the historical background of the creation of legal system toward empowering the ideology strong nationalism dominant in one ethnic. Let me finish by answering a few questions that might explain the broader picture rather than just outlining what's in the book. Why did I conceive and write this book. I wrote this book to emphasize how law can legitimize occupation, how law is a tool to legitimize continuous colonization. Land regimes and policies are used to control, confiscate land and permit exclusive access to one superior ethnic group. It's end over to unfold the law geography of power questions. I started by tracing the land law from Ottoman period for digging in from Ottoman period, followed by the British Empire reaching the to present day. How land law has been involved in marginalizing the Palestinian from accessing their own lands and houses, then using direct indirect me mechanism, such as land expropriation, forced house eviction, and emergency laws as a tool to exclude accessibility to land and resources. What are the political and economic consequences of this marginalization? The attempt is to shed the light on the Palestinian living under Israel and their legitimacy of the Israel and Jerusalem in particular, and explore their daily discrimination and equality struggle under the Israeli laws. The main focus on their land and housing rights that violated their fundamental human rights. Secondly, why I would recommend you reading the book. What I would like, for, hopefully, you will get from reading this book. It will attract who uh, or whom, let's first discuss who, who are the crowd that I'm thinking that might find my book uh, interesting. 
It will um, attract international legal scholars, legal theorists, to human rights practitioners, students, and also it might be helpful to NGOs and academic focusing in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, colonization, post-colonization studies, people who are interested in legal geography theory and power questions, and for sure human rights issues. I would like them to recognize the complexity of Israel, Conf, uh, complexity of Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the importance of narratives of Palestinian people regarding land issues and Jerusalem. At the heart of all the question of occupation, settler colonization regimes, and ongoing injustice and inequality. My, if I put it briefly, three important engagement of my intervention of this book, in thematically, I could it put is law and politics, for instance, law geography of power and law of justice. I try to address a way of understanding the Palestinian struggle over land, legal geography lenses. I intend to argue that if we look former colonization, we can learn how it continues to inform legal structure today in our present day contemporary days. My big question that I try to underpin in the book, um, it's again, the book tried to analyze land law through lenses of international law, colonization, legal geography in general, and it aims to provide comprehensive scholarly examination of land law for Palestinian under Israeli law. First, it focuses on land law, provides overview of under international law, and following the background, focusing on land expropriation and house eviction. It matters to me as it's crucial to comprehend how the systematic nature process of marginalizations are mapped out in various ways across the civil, political, and socioeconomic landscape. Before reading the book, if, like I think that my my readers think that thought that new power adopted fully and automatically the laws of the previous land regime of former ruler, as they had the same goals like colonization. But for example, purposes such as control natural resources, such as land, water, to fulfill their ambitious control and power. But having read my book, what I wish that my reader might take with them, if they will say each realize how each colonizer has different aim and vision while implementing control over the land to impose their new power over various groups, ethnic groups. Building up a new land regime inherited from the former colonizer was done selectively, not entirely, as the new colonizer methods are improving and developing, developing over the time. So what um, I hope that a reader could uh, I read that uh, the exclusion of Palestinian within the state of Israel and resistance with Jerusalem then systematically developed the tools of the colonizer into brought it into the new era of the state of Israel and they try to pretend that it's legitimized. And the case of Sheikh Jarrah, the daily struggle of those people maybe provide us more closer look of literally how law could um, harm their daily uh, life and living under the threat of uh, of eviction, forced eviction in daily basis, daily life, while they have lack of accessibility to the legal system and to the language that this legal system used is new way of creative way of how legal systems newly create an architecture of exclusion of uh, those people. They are they are struggling in daily basis in their lifetime. It's not just only merely academic aspect of things. So I tried also to, um, to understand by in my conclusion chapter where I thought that access denied of the resources of the land, marginalization and political and systematic marginalization in all aspects are mapped out in various aspects, not only in land, but land was is, as examination case study to uh, shed the light of the people who struggle over decades. And Israel legal system land regimes are, is using various ways across all examination, discrimination, marginalization, direct and indirect for the Palestinian people, non-Jewish non ethnicities across 
all the civil, political, and socioeconomic landscape, not only in land regimes. So I hope you will have the chance to read the book, to enjoy it, and um, follow the details that I try to cover uh, in my chapters. Thank you today. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Doctor. I can see why you said 20 minutes is almost impossible. But uh, I must say the way you had sensitized us to uh, the content, the way I formulated it, there seems to be a timelessness about it, you know, for us to be, um, to be able to discern, you know, how it took, how it, uh, how the past had uh, used land to oppress, um, to dominate and going into the future. Um, so I think it's a very valuable resource. Before we go on to our, our next respected speaker, I just want to uh, echo Olivia's apology in the um, in the chat for the, the silly disruption. I just don't understand uh, uh, people that think that that sort of disruption can be disruptive because it has not moved any of us. And they obviously underestimate the uh, resilience of the Palestinian people as well as the comrades in the room if they do think that uh, that sort of thing can throw us off. So uh, we apologize for that, but uh, it is it means absolutely nothing. Um, Dr. Randy Lau, on that note, I would like to ask you to please go ahead and enlighten us also about your book. Thank you. Ma'am, you, uh, you are muted, ma'am. Ah, oh, sorry. Thank you, Samira. And thanks for Nelson Mandela University. Thanks for Leslie and the team. And uh, thanks for Simon for being here. I'm so happy to that you have uh, came and, uh, and you are with us. Okay, I'm going to do a presentation. With the presentation, I hope to shed the light on some of the parts of the book. Can you see? Uh, it is kind of up, Doc. Um, probably not a second or so. It's not on yet. No, no, it's not fully displaying. You can talk. Oh. Okay, just a minute. Okay, just a minute, let me. Okay, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, uh, thank you, Hadil, also for presenting, uh, for presenting the actual uh, context uh, in Palestine and the challenges that people are facing daily um, uh, on uh, on daily basis and different ways, legalized, of course, uh, uh, with ethnic cleansing, legalized by the law uh, in different ways. Uh, now, I would like to share the presentation. I think now it's sharing. Is it sharing now? Can you see it? Yes, Doc, you can just put it on full screen, but it is, yeah, there we go. Okay, good. Uh, well, uh, I just want to share with you some of the findings of the book uh, so that uh, uh, it can give you a trigger in order to understand what's behind it and what are we doing. My book about the value of vocational education and training in advancing human development and reducing inequality. And here I'm talking about the overall issue, but from the case of Palestine, and from uh, uh, listening to the voices of the people there and analyzing their situation, analyzing the inequality that they have. Uh, of course, the, the problem analysis is based on my PhD research that I did in the University of Nottingham. The work is based on a strand of work started by the call of Magra in 2012 uh, re uh, regarding the linking of TIVET with human development. And I took it further to inequality, especially with the richness of the Palestinian case of various inequality uh, issues that uh, the Palestinians face daily. And uh, this work has been culminated by uh, the paper of Magra L uh, 2020. It also uh, takes my earlier work further or in the year 2012 and also is built 
and looks at other work in South Africa, Powell, 2012-2014, uh, other countries and other reports, international reports as well. The research is also in line with the recent shift in pivot towards human development and social justice and interest in identifying ways of measuring progress towards pivot contribution to development and equality. Also the complex and quasi status in Palestine, it's good that Hadil has presented the legal law, especially for Palestinians inside Israel and for Palestinians in Jerusalem. But also I would like to further complicate the issues <laughs> by presenting the map of the occupied Palestinian territories, let's call it, uh, under international law uh, that it presents three parts and uh, each three parts have got its own different ways. Gaza Strip is totally isolated. Jerusalem is under ethnic cleansing uh, uh, policies, housing, residency and existence is under threat. Uh, while the West Bank, 60% of the West Bank is off limits. And it's called Zone C because the West Bank is divided into Zone A, B, and C. So uh, the West Bank areas of A, which is the middle, uh, the city center of the governorate, are, uh, are surrounded, uh, are our cage, let's say, that if we want to pass through from A to B and B to C, we have to, uh, to go over uh, a difficult uh, system of mobility restriction for people and, and uh, even uh, trade and goods. And sometimes there is a permit regime that controls our mobility. And of course, the people from Gaza cannot come from the West Bank for the West Bank, except for certain permits, which is impossible. Same for the people from the West Bank to Jerusalem. So in that sense, we have a complicated system, which is not one system, but it's a, a multiple system of oppression and, and controlled by a regime that is put by the military occupation. The other fact is that in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, following the Oslo Agreement in 1994, there was, uh, uh, there was certain uh, effort uh, uh, supported by the international community to go towards state building. And even the UN has, organized, has uh, recognized Palestine as the state of Palestine, while in fact, it's still the occupied Palestinian territory. So that's why we have this quasi status of, uh, uh, of occupied Palestinian territories suffering from protracted protection crisis as UN OCHA has uh, put it. And also we have the state building effort that we are uh, trying to do as Palestinians uh, with uh, of course, all of this complication and all of this, uh, uh, let me say, um, organized uh, regulations and policies uh, to dismantle the people's right to uh, freedom and uh, all the violation of human rights adds levels of inequality for the Palestinian people. So, and uh, the newly published report in 2021 has mentioned, of course, you and if you want to read more about what's going on in Palestine and understand more, go to UN OCHA uh, website where they have a lot of uh, actual fact sheets and reports and and everything that shows you day to day what the Palestinians are going through. Um, also, there has been new published reports in the year 2021 by international organization about the apartheid regime and ethnic cleansing policies uh, in Palestine. Uh, and, uh, and that was uh, also has presented a hit and pointing out truly to what's going on there. Now, even the story of the vocational education and training in Palestine is the story of the Palestinians because the providers of vocational education and training, some of them have started before 1948. Why do I mention 1948? Because 1948, uh, uh, upon the onset and the, and the establishment of the State of Israel, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were expelled out of their homeland and were made refugees. 
and to cater for these refugees and provide and who lost their land, lost their source of income, to cater for these people, then the uh, uh, lots of organizations, international organizations, NGOs, uh, even church-related organizations, started to provide vocational education and training for the people. UNRWA was established in 1948-49, and they started to provide vocational education and training as well. UNRWA is the UN organization catering for the refugees, uh, for the Palestinian refugees in, in Palestine and in the region. And also there are different governmental institutes with different stories. The Ministry of Education has followed the Jordanian because between the year 1948 to 1967, the West Bank was annexed to the uh, Jordanians and, uh, and uh, Gaza to the Egyptians. So the Jordanian Ministry of Education who started the schools at that time has uh, uh, moved that into the West Bank as well. The Ministry of Labor was controlled by the Israelis at that time and they wanted laborers to build their settlements. So they started training laborers to build their settlement and Ministry of Social Affairs were, was taking care of the uh, social cases. But anyway, in 19, 94, when PA took over, uh, all these ministries started to uh, train the Palestinians towards the goal of uh, liberation and state building and uh, enhancing the economy and, uh, uh, and youth employment and so on. And there was a VET, a TIVET strategy in 1999, Action Plan 2003, Renew the Strategy 2010. So there were some efforts on the national level towards developing TIVET in that way. Donor support fluctuated, but VET has got many challenges, but still have external, of course, access and efficiency and internal, the lack of unified governance. Although now newly established TIVET Commission could provide uh, support in that area. The objectives or aims of the study, uh, of the research, to explore the contribution of VET learners' achievements and aspiration to analyze marginalization within the Palestinian context, structural challenges to vet learners, link the analysis to the achievement of aspiration and identify whether inequalities are reduced or reproduced in a way. And the framework I've used, it included the human development approach, it in included the gender and development theory, and it included political economy as well. Now the methodology I have, uh, uh, it was a combination of qualitative and quantitative methods. Uh, 1,240 1, people representing uh, were engaged in the study, representing vocational education and training, graduates, students, teachers, counselors, and management of their institutes. Uh, 746 out of them were graduates who filled the survey as well. They were consulted through different methods like focus group discussion, and uh, semi-structured interviews and so on. 33 VET institutes were engaged also representing, and they were field visited, uh, representing the different VET providers between governmental, non-governmental, semi-governmental, UN bodies, and so on. Uh, eight directorates, educational directorates, two ministry, uh, ministries, and two employer representatives were also consulted, as well as 10 employers uh, and several community representatives. And people uh, uh, consulted were from West Bank, including Jerusalem, and from Gaza. Now, the marginalization within the Palestinian context, as I defined it, it, uh, it, it caters for different aspects. The economic, social, and educational is together with different parts of the world uh, and can be shared with different parts of the world. While the context-related marginalization it's the context, uh, context of occupation. It's the context of marginalization due to the military occupation regime and its own policies and measures. And uh, accordingly, uh, I subdivided that into the context-related vulnerable localities. And here, when we talk about vulnerable localities, we're talking about people living in Area C, the 60% of the West Bank that I told you about, Theme zones, and I did not talk about this, these are areas that are trapped between the Green Line and the, uh, and the West Bank. So in, in that sense, uh, they are barred. They, are, they have gates in order to go to their communities. 
so these are, have also different issues. Uh, East Jerusalem, with its multiple different ways of following the Israeli uh, laws and regulation, but at the same time, under international law, they're part of the West Bank, and uh, at the same time, the uh, uh, the uh, mobility restriction isolated from the different areas of the West Bank, where they can uh, uh, have their own services, lives, and so on, and also isolate the people from the West Bank to Jerusalem, which was once, Jerusalem was once, it is the capital of Palestine considered by the Palestinians, and it was once really hosting most of the educational, uh, health, uh, other institutes that is um, uh, catering for uh, the Palestinians as a whole, even for Gaza. It was affected, and those, uh, this is the context related vulnerability related to the locality they are living in. That's number one. Secondly, it's uh, those affected by the Israeli occupation. Uh, Hadil has mentioned in details the uh, appropriation of land and uh, uh, the laws, how they are used. And, and uh, of course, this is added to uh, uh, loss of lands and resources, loss of livelihoods, residents. So those who are the victims of the direct action or act against them uh, were also part of the groups uh, that has been uh, mentioned here. Uh, refugees and those refugees are acknowledged and they are formal uh, written in the uh, lists of the UNRWA, a UN organization made for the refugees of the Palestinians, uh, of the previous 1948 and 1967 uh, wars. Uh, others, like ex detainees, are also part of the context related marginalized groups. And the other three, as I mentioned, are shared with the rest of the world, but mainly is the context-related marginalization, which is the case of Palestine, and it could be shared with any other country living under military occupation in a way or another, having the same regime. What we have found is that, what I have found is that vet graduates are the marginalized youth. And although they, uh, 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 in a way, uh, we found that uh, one of three of those graduates are directly affected by the context. And 35% uh, were coming from marginalized communities. 27 are living in area C. So those affected by the conflict, 50%, half of them have lost their livelihood and quarter of them has lost their land. Uh, they and their family, of course. And 7% uh, lost their residence uh, and this is, a true representation in a way of the population <laughs> in some way or another, and it could be even more. So this is what the Palestinians are going through, through the uh, analyzing the situation of the Tibet graduates, over 750 Tibet graduates uh, from the different areas of uh, the occupied Palestinian territory. The economic uh, related vulnerabilities, two out of three had uh, low income. And of course, here, even when we talk about economic related vulnerability, the economy in Palestine is marginalized due to the uh, uh, sets of uh, policies and regimes that although in 1994, they said to the PA, you have a government, but they don't control the borders, they don't control the currency, they don't control the uh, economic policies, uh, banking, and so on. So in that sense, uh, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, pressure on that. And as a consequence, over 50% of our uh, private sector businesses are informal. So as a consequence, uh, uh, this has affected employment capacity, has affected poverty, and deep poverty, and so on. Also, there were social related vulnerabilities uh, related uh, to attracting uh, marginalized women in different ways, uh, uh, and uh, also the educational uh, related vulnerabilities. Anyway, what we found also, what I found also is that those affected by the context uh, related vulnerability are also affected by the economic related vulnerability. And it's, uh, of course, natural when you have, and this is how we have uh, uh, used the intersectionality in order to see how the different inequalities are intersectional to each other. So we cannot say gender on its own if it's not 
on a class level or a political or a context related level or so on. So that's how uh, uh, the uh, we've, uh, of course, the people who has lost their land, the people who has lost their lives, uh, uh, one member of the family, the father, or whatever, they've lost their uh, breadwinner, or whatever, due to uh, imprisonment, or uh, or killed, or uh, lost their houses or resources, has affected their economic related vulnerability for sure. And uh, of course, poverty has shown that it has a vertical intersectionality within the different uh, inequalities that has been present uh, by the Tibet graduates. And of course, the VIT learners, uh, as I said, witnessed multi layers of intersectional inequalities. And the context related inequalities is unique, as we mentioned, uh, to the Palestinian case, and it reflects the context marginalization. And here, a little bit of Tibet away from the Palestinian uh, topic, but it will bring us back there immediately. Because here, uh, we looked at the aspiration of the graduates. Why did they go to Tibet? What was their uh, aspiration of going to Tibet? And of course, here, uh, my dear friend, uh, Powell, uh, she is the one who has brought up the aspiration as well into the table of Tibet. So here, uh, most of them talked about status, about income, about employment and skills, so that to support themselves and to continue their uh, work, their survival and the re and resilience uh, for themselves and their communities. And of course, I've used Powell uh, capability list of 2014 and added to it the gender and inequality determinants and enriched with the within the case of Palestine and also. Uh, so it became 10, uh, the capabilities instead of eight. Also, I tested the achievement and I added the policymaker valued functioning for increasing accountability as well uh, for the policymakers. So these are the 10 determinants, the economic opportunities, domestic work, economic resources, active citizenship. And here also, because I used the gender and development theory, I linked it with the empowerment indicators and uh, so I link the active citizenship with a part of the empowerment indicator power with and the confidence and personal empowerment with power within and the sense of uh, which is the sense of agency. Of course, bodily in, uh, integrity was there, sense and imagination, yes. And of course, when we talked about bodily in integrity here, we talked about violence and gen not only gender based violence, but also occupational related violence that is affecting the uh, uh, the st status and well-being of the students and the vet learners. Also, senses imagin uh, and imagination, recognition, upgrade, and enable the world of work, and so on. So we found out that regardless of the situation, the pivot and vet graduates were able to transit, were able to find employment, uh, were able to participate in the labor force much more than other than others. Yet, it's still affected by the context, decent work and gender. Decent work and gender could be related to policy issues, although sometimes even decent work, because I continued doing other, other researches other than, uh, and I added that to the book. Uh, in addition to the research that I did through my PhD, I also did other studies that I added its finding as well. Uh, which is uh, ensuring and confirming the finding of the PhD in, in, in that uh, area. But also, even when we talk about decent work and gender, it is a policy issue and can be controlled by the policy, but also the policy level and the policy measures are also sometimes challenged and curtailed by the Israeli occupation uh, uh, ability and and uh, and of course the economic uh, uh, level and so on. Here also we talked about the uh, poverty uh, and we found that uh, over half of the graduates are contributing to family income. Two thirds are male and even one third of the females are contributing to family income. Also contributed to improve the financial status of 50% of the household and sustain the financial status of 44% of them. And one, of, one fifth of the graduates had been able to set up a new family as well as part of the 
And of course, these results has varied according to poverty, gender, and uh, of course, linked to gender-based uh, expectations and roles as well. Now, uh, I will not go through the 10 other capabilities, that eight other capabilities, they are in the book. And uh, when you look at it, you will find also here, I'm going through very quickly the percentages and some of the data, but also there you will find some quotes of the people, of the students, of the, uh, and you will find some uh, uh, real uh, life uh, stories uh, in that sense, uh, uh, told by the students themselves, uh, by the voices of the graduates or the pet learners. So we found out that 42% of those graduates reported that they at least achieved 75% of the aspirations. This is very good. But the most amazing thing is that these percentages rose significantly for those living in scene zones and Gaza, whom are the least achieved on the economic level. So it's not only economic level, it's much more than that. And this is showing how that is contributing to human development as well and inequality and how uh, vet learners are not only looking at financial gains, but also looking at the other issues that they have uh, specified uh, in their aspiration and also was mentioned in the uh, 10 capabilities that we have identified. Uh, and But although the results have shown higher satisfaction, but when I compared it to other study that I made in 2012 for NGOs, I found out that there was a drop. And this is due to the external challenges and negative factors. And in between the last, between 2012 and 2015, when I did the, uh, the field work and uh, collected the data, uh, lots of issues has uh, happened and even 2012, I think it was related to 2010 data. So during the five years, uh, every year, I will tell you, every year the situation in Palestine is deteriorating. Every year, and this can show, uh, is shown through the numbers. And when you see that every year we have wars, we have uh, uh, closures, we have uh, uh, demolition of houses, we have uh, uh, all these violations will surely lead to uh, less uh, satisfaction in a way, although uh, uh, they are doing much better than others, other uh, peers of their age. And also we looked at the empowerment indicators. Here we have set, uh, I've set 23 indicators following the Kabir uh, uh, gender and development theory. Uh, empowerment indicators, and I have put, uh, and it was according to power within, power to, power over, power with. And of course, power within is the thing that uh, everybody controls in a way, which is self confidence, self uh, uh, skills confidence, while power to is more, uh, less controllable because it's related with family members, but it's uh, in a way, it's a bit, uh, Yani. It could be also uh, a semi-control. The power over, which is freedom of decision-making of life choices. This was curtailed by various uh, uh, issues uh, related to gender, related to context, related to uh, the situation that Palestinians are living under. And of course, also power with participation, public life. Also, this was uh, affected by the uh, context as a whole. So here you can find that how power within is very high, while power over uh, and the uh, uh, achievement of uh, empowerment indicator for women was higher than men for the three parts, while power over, this is the gender uh, issue, shows that it was lower than men uh, in uh, taking decisions regarding their future and career. But as we mentioned also, uh, there are uh, the context issue is a main also uh, uh, challenge to uh, all uh, achievement of empowerment. So also uh, uh, in the research, I looked at the uh, social and economic empowerment of the families. 
because due to that now they are able to be a main source of income, source of employment and empowering the status. And also uh, I looked at the kinship relation and adversity and work ch chain phenomena. One of the uh, researchers have uh, uh, put the details on the life of the, in the refugee camps and how the family uh, in losing all their resources are investing in the family resource and how they are supporting themselves in that sense. So in this case, the VET enables the family uh, resource plan uh, in that sense. Also, it has empowered the marginalized economy in a fragile context by providing the needed human resources for this economy. And also it provided resilience and empowerment of community. I have added the case of East Jerusalem in because it is a different case and a different status where it has, uh, I have shown through certain uh, 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 models, how it has contributed to local economies under attack, and how it provided skills as resources for used fastness, uh, fastness in their communities. Also, in looking at political economy, where, uh, uh, of course, skill, uh, as uh, uh, referring to Philip Brown, Andy John Green, and Hugh Lauder, where the skills acquisition and utilization are social acts and represent more than some of individual acts, and of course the complexity in the OPT and here what they are saying, but the complexity in the OPT itself and its quasi status has indicated that most of the indicators are not met as should be. And furthermore, the Tivit sector is still marginalized because even the government and its policies and the economy and the private sector uh, all are under the contextual challenges that we are facing. So the structural challenges, even as noted by you, are related to mobility restrictions and other occupational measures, uh, structure economic, uh, structure economic uh, challenges, unemployment, poverty, and so on, are also affected by the uh, context and attributed to the overall context uh, and economic constraints. And of course, uh, the imposed on the PA, the Paris Protocol that links the economy and its prices within the PA with Israel, in spite of the huge difference in earnings. The GDP, as I put in uh, the study, between the three area is enormous. The difference between them is enormous. Here you are talking at, uh, in Gaza, you can um, uh, compare it to uh, Suman. In West Bank, you can compare it to Jordan. In Israel, where Jerusalem is uh, affected by, you can compare it to Europe. So you can see the huge difference between the economies and its effect also on the people as well. The gender discrimination, of course, has affected uh, uh, women and their choices, and choices is very important for agency in that sense. So. In the study, I have, re uh, I have uh, identified and demonstrated, the research has uh, uh, demonstrated doc? various doc, points. Doc, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt, Doc. Do you mind if we perhaps just yeah. wrap up after yeah. this? Yes, this is the last, uh, uh, Yani. I just wanted to show that uh, these you. are the uh, final things that I have identified, and you can find them in the in details sure. in the book. And uh, what the research brings is the global debate on Tibet, uh, to development, the analyzed inequality, the quasi status and the relation in Palestine, and the valuable uh, information on those engaged in that. And of course, it's a model also for other South countries and in conflict and post conflict countries uh, for low and medium enterprises. And I showed how the I wrote papers and conferences, uh, and that has uh, 75 uh, citations for those. Uh, uh, papers and uh, 2.5k uh, reads, which shows that uh, the status even uh, or the research has has been uh, has even uh, uh, contributed to the global debate as a whole. Thank you very much. I will stop here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Ilal. You know, I can see why um, our late and great. Uh, Madiba had such a heart for Palestine. We're so similar, our histories. 
are really linked and uh, and yeah so uh, colleagues, friends, comrades, there you have it, land and vet, there's mechanisms, you know, uh, of apartheid. In fact, it's not even mechanisms. Um, they used the, the things that give us meaning uh, as human beings, to, uh, as domination uh, for hegemony to oppress. So please do um, interrogate. I'm going to take hands and I'm going to, but I'll first go to the chat and take questions from there. And I'm going to start with the last one uh, from Leslie first and then move up. So uh, Dr. Hilal, um, Leslie is asking, how did you correct the aspirations expressed by Palestinian vet students with ways in which people adapt their preferences to what they perceive is possible within the limitations of the oppression that they experience? Mm -hmm. Can uh, we? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Of course, uh, of course, and and the aspiration of the students were even. Uh, I remember when we started talking about the human development uh, uh, approach as a whole, and talking about freedoms. No, even if we if we say that forty two percent of the graduates think that they achieved over seventy five percent. They did not achieve. Uh, they did not achieve all their freedoms. They did not achieve all their aspirations because they are constrained. They are constrained by various issues. Yet the uh, uh, the interesting part is that not only, as I mentioned, economic or poverty are the main issues behind because uh, the uh, uh, orthodox theories try to link it only to economy. Uh, it's also linked to the uh, uh, to the human being, to the development, to the agency, to the empowerment, to the other factors that has affected them. And that's why we saw in Gaza, where they are less employed, uh, more poor, uh, at the at the same time they are more constrained even, but they have found more, they have achieved more of their aspiration. Uh, uh, in that way. So uh, in that sense, uh, it shows that it's, uh, it's, it's the whole well-being and it's the agency that the people uh, has gained uh, that provided them with, uh, uh, with way of thinking, with tools to act uh, so that it has helped them in their uh, future or in their way of uh, achievement, uh, uh, how did they uh, talk about their achievement in a way, or assess their achievement, yeah. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Both Ellen and Ruby Ann are expressing similar comments here. They, they say how your work exposes the duplicity of Israel claiming equal treatment of citizens. And uh, yeah, I think that both your books are a resource a valuable resource that uh, you know that uh, for us to consult with. Um, so when we say, "Oh, there is this oppression from Israel," and I mean both of your books answer that. I mean, show that evidence very palpably. Uh, Ruby Ann says that uh, these books add to the body of evidence that clearly shows the impact of legislation and tools being used by the Israeli government. And she's also very thankful to both of you, as is Ellen. Uh, for the excellent work indeed. Uh, so is uh, Simon as well and Nazir Ali as well and Salim Valley as well. Uh, the next question I'd like to take from Mariam, she says, she's asking to what extent is the employment rate of Palestinian graduates related to occupation and how does this occupation create unemployment? Okay. Uh -huh. Well, uh, of course, uh, uh, in the restriction over the private sector uh, as a whole, in regulation, in competition, in uh, increasing the raw material through borders, is uh, for Gaza. Gaza is in total isolation, and if they need, and there is only there is a list of uh, maybe 150, 300, I can't, I did not follow up, but there is a list of only a number of raw material that they can export. 
even uh, pasta they could not export <laughs> for some reasons. So what are we talking about? They are controlling our air, our land, our roads, our uh, the mobility restriction to trade, uh, even for private sector, when they exp when they move things from one place to another, uh, the transportation cost is double because they have to on the blockade to do something called door to door or back to back. Uh, so they have to empty what is in this truck to that truck because this truck is not allowed to go to this area. And that truck is not allowed to go to this area. So you can imagine. And of course, there is a lot of businesses that are informal and family businesses who are sometimes are uh, uh, will not really employ people unless it's one of their sons or whatever. But at the same time, there is a great opportunity also for entrepreneurs, for people who want to start their own business. But uh, uh, yani, also, there is another challenge that we face uh, regarding employment is that Israel, sometimes it absorbs some of the civic graduates and some of the intellectuals, some of the people, and gives them three or five times the salary that they take in the West Bank or in Gaza. So this also <coughs> makes another uh, human resources poverty within the economy. So how can the economy grow and provide uh, employment opportunities when it's restricted all over and competed with all over? Mm, look, the, those intentions from the occupiers are blatant. I mean, whatever you said now is what they really want to do and achieve. So um, Alan is asking uh, to her, Dr. Hadil, how effective is human rights legal work presently as one year that the legal space in terms of opposition has shrunk greatly uh, in during this period in the last period oh uh, you are doctor you are muted yeah thanks for the question alan and i think uh, uh one of the uh, reflections of what we are seeing how shrinking the um, human rights work in Palestine. We just uh, witnessed last Thursday uh, when Israel delivered uh, a six uh, notice of a uh, closure of six of uh, one of the most important uh, human rights organization in West Bank, uh, and they give them announcement uh, information that they are uh, closing because they're designating them as terrorist uh, uh, terrorist. Uh, organization working uh, rather than explosion, the oppression of the Israeli um, violation of the human rights. And it's important to mention that since 67, Israel has banded more than, it's not the first time that Israel banded NGO work and the human rights organization working, which putting the, uh, emphasize how important the work that they are doing when they're illustrating the violation that the occupation doing in regarding of the uh, human rights. This is why Israel, since it's not the first time of those six uh, organizations such as Haq and Al-Mizan and more. So Israel banded more than 400 local and international organizations, including all major political parties. And uh, Israel uh, now uh, attacking those NGOs and the human rights in particular, because those are trying to uh, reach the International Criminal Court, addressing the, um, uh, in, in the uh, the violation of uh, the major violation of Israel uh, uh, leaders against the human rights and uh, committing crimes against the humanity and all of this confiscation of all the material that uh, those NGOs uh, collecting is one of the main reasons why Israel is trying to shrink even the last uh, this important work that this human rights work is that tool that we as again as Palestinian under the uh, oppressed uh, we have uh, limited tools we have to use all the available tools the legal methods as well is not the um, uh, you know uh, won't be an easy path to words of freedom the, again the question of the people of Sheikh Jarrah would should they address their case in the uh, within the uh, Israeli legal system is kind of returning us to the core of the question of with Israel respecting the basic human rights of the Palestinians even like why I give the examples of the Palestinian living within the state of Israel because those is the Palestinian within the state of Israel and also I'm a member of them we is officially fully citizen of Israel yet Israel 
Israel as it describes itself. And it's not because of our favor. It's the international law force Israel when they occupied Palestine in 1948 to provide the people who remained within their land the present absentees. We are present absentees, remained in our land. We are refugees within our own land. So even within those people who supposedly are fully citizen, fully supposedly in democratic state, the only democracy in the Middle East, yet we don't have any um, ways to tools to to we kind of facing indirect discrimination struggle with discrimination accessibility to all our uh, marginalizing our uh, rights because israel again respect the human rights and international whenever it came to their ethnic superior national uh, Jew, jewish people within the state and israel described itself first as jewish and then democratic states in their basic laws that kind of brings us at link us again to all the human rights uh, organization trying to uh, protect the, collect the data, protecting the people. Like now, Palestinian people more systematic. We all have the same uh, we, uh, kind of more systematic. How to use the international law? Is that the only? Is that to rule that can, could free Palestine? It's not enough. But yet we have to fight in all paths possible venues, even if it's Israeli Supreme Court, even if it's International Criminal Court. They will close these NGOs. We reopen other NGOs. Those people still keep working under the threat that they will imprison them. But they don't care. Benny Gantz, the person and that who's now is the Ministry of Security. He's the one giving the order because he's personally will be attacked by, will be affected by international criminal court decision in case if we will be optimistic, well, I'm not with the international legal system as we know, as Rwanda gave examples of East Jerusalem, that uh, Israel never respected the status of East Jerusalem according to international law is occupied territory, yet Israel attacked the, like attacked the people as residents of Israel and uh, I fulfill all the laws under uh, this um, big umbrella. So it, do I have faith in the human rights system? No, but do have, we have other options to fight through? We have to keep all our doors open and go forward regardless if it's kind of the only way, no only way, because we are people under oppression trying to use all the tools eligible we have um, under our control to try to use, uh, to, to have our voices heard and keep our fight uh, towards freedom. And uh, we will reopen other uh, NGOs, and those NGOs won't be closed because we now more aware of our rights, our tool, and we are accessible to use the tools of how to fight in a let's say systematic way, pragmatic way. And I'm, I'm, I'm like like super uh, sending my solidarity through this also forum uh, towards all these six organizations and any like uh, and they deserve all their support because they're professionally working as well using the human rights mechanism trying to reach our uh, right like people palestinian people right through all the open venues viva viva <laughs> listen before i get to um uh, to ruby and 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 and, and leslie's very poignant question i just want to bring up something that maria has picked up on she's asking um something that we don't hear often uh doc Dr. Hussein and Dr. Ilal, she's asking, how is it different, briefly, uh, the Ottoman occupation to Israeli occupation? It's not very commonly spoke to, spoken about. I have heard it, but uh, how is it different? Yeah. Uh, the idea of, of where I dig in the, in the Ottoman uh, colonization regarding with the tools, uh, Ottoman uh, regime used more the like religion uh, classification mm. of the people yeah. like that. And this is how they used to uh, prevent people, uh, average people, Palestinian people access towards the land. And still the same uh, mentality of each colonizer, they want to uh, control the resources from the people uh, who own those resources is first thing land, water in Palestine is an issue nowadays and what were the main reasons why Israel keep fighting in like the, the, the neighborhood countries. So the idea of thinking how, and, and Israel is still using some of the laws from Ottoman period in regarding of law, but yet I give the example why they are using this, why they are not using the other uh, land regime from the Ottoman period, because they're using it based on whatever they need in this current contemporary days. They still, there's laws within the land regime of Israel still from the Ottoman period, but then they use religion uh, issue excuses rather than ethnicity as we are currently uh, viewing in the Ottoman, uh, the, the post-colonial, like the Israel post-colonial country. Yeah. 
Mm, okay. Ruby Ann is also asking how we can uh, support the Palestinian people to highlight these atrocities of the closing down of human rights organizations. It's very heartbreaking for us. It's also enraging at the same time. And there is some, so we are asking, Ruby Ann is asking, how can we help you um, uh, with this closing down of NGOs? I like how you said you will just carry on opening another one, but uh, how can we help? Highlight the issue. Uh, let your your people, uh, like um, the official who could complain, like uh, reaching addressing the issue within the you and you and community, the international law community. All this, uh, like address the topic, speak about it, address the right people to try to um, have veto against Israel. Clay, support these NGOs financially because we need, uh, like probably they will need, like the first thing they will do when they they will ban. Uh, reaching the resources to those NGOs to continue doing the field work. So yes, you can have role. You can let the Palestinian voices heard. You should have, like, we all have responsibility in the world as a human to have solidarity with the people who are under, under oppression. Each of us as individuals still can have uh, influence, yet broader aspects of even officially, when, now within the six NGOs, at tackling this addressing your official to reach the international level to try to prevent Israel from the implications of what does that mean to close this uh, NGOs uh, uh, for the future and uh, you know boycott Israel <laughs> boycott uh, like uh, BDS movement is one of the um, mm. probably like the yeah BDS movement yeah like there's tools that still as individual as small people we can do and as mm. institutions still. We, we can provide, we are still like very limited, but at least the attempts to try keep us kind of the dignity. Yeah. We can't stay silent. I mean, awareness is one of the main issues that we need towards any oppressor, against any oppressor. And Israel can't control the mainstream media as it used before because the, the mainstream media is not as important as it used to be. So we have to kind of, you know, protect a project over all, you know, the liars of like the small social media broader and Randa probably could also add uh, something in, in that. I think. Yeah, I want to add here that the EU, countries of the EU has said that they don't agree to the closure of uh, this organization and they will continue supporting them. So if you can get your government to say, we will continue supporting these six organizations, this is also an addition and saying that we do not agree or we do not uh, uh, I mean, we're, we're not in agreement with your uh, decision. So uh, in addition to what mentioned by uh, Hadil of uh, international law, international uh, UN organizations and so on, but just announcing uh, yani the EU announcement saying that we will continue supporting these people, that was something, yani, I, I would say. Mm. And just one comment following up, Randa, the EU uh, representative within the uh, Palestinian territories, and the same day that those al haq received the closure, they came with it into the al haq building, reopened the building, have uh, their press conference from the building. Such uh, important, symbolic, yet effective tools that will give um, the idea to Israel that you can't just keep oppressed these people with no limits, with no regulations, there's laws, their international law will get affected and we will keep continue. I hope that they will keep continue, but even this symbolic in the same day, it was very important to the people of, of all those organizations to go back to work tomorrow, despite all the fears, the threats from Israel uh, and uh, like the official uh, system. Yeah. Okay. I would love to take more, but unfortunately, uh, more questions that is and 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 um, engage with you again passionately. Um, but unfortunately, we are out of time, and I just want to say thank you to our two. It's not only um, uh, our own human. It's not only uh, Nelson Mandela that has made us your brothers and your sisters, uh, Dr. Hussein and Dr. Ilal. It is our humanity and your humanity and our histories are connected. So there is. There can be no other better way to describe our relationship and we will forever be connected um, when you get your freedom also. And it's not if you get, it's when you get your freedom. So we thank you. We are humble because we 
have come through what so much in our uh, history, but we are still um, learning from you. Everything that you're saying, and you know, is something that we can take back to our spaces and uh, back to our work. You know, so we are really humble because we are learning from from you as well. So I thank you. I thank you. I thank you so much for this. And it's not the end. We're definitely coming back to you again. And uh, we look forward to the next interaction. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Have a lovely evening. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. My great pleasure. Bye bye. Bye bye.